start. So I'm just going to say that it's Irene Amon for your professor. I really brought a real um, jolt of vigor and rigor to the intellectual life of the school by having panels and colloquiums about really interesting areas of patent and intellectual property law. And today is consistent with that effort that she's made because today we're going to have a panel on intellectual property and eminent domain, of which I know nothing about actually here to listen to most of it. And uh, so I want to introduce you to some of you know already, I mean it. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you especially to our panelists for uh, coming out to our school. Uh, so, uh, as Dean mentioned, I'm an associate professor here and the director of the Center for Intellectual Property Law. One of the goals of the CIPL is to have events on topics uh, that maybe haven't gotten all the attention that they deserved elsewhere. So, very excited today to have these illustrious panelists here with me. I'm going to introduce them briefly and then uh, Professor Soman will speak, uh, Professor Dolan and I will uh, split our time and then Professor Long will speak and we'll leave about 10-15 minutes for questions from the audience. So I'm going to start with Professor Soman because he's going first. Uh, he's a professor of law at George Mason University School of Law. His research is on constitutional law, property law, and the study of uh, popular political participation and its implications for constitutional democracy. He has several books out, uh, one that's forthcoming, The Grasping Hand, Kilo v. City of New London and the Limits of Eminent Domain, so very relevant to our topic today, uh, as well as Democracy and Political Ignorance, Why Smaller Government is Smarter, and he's the co-author of A Conspiracy Against Obamacare, The Volok Conspiracy and the Healthcare Case. He has authored numerous law review articles and high profile, in high profile publications, and he also blogs at the Bulldog Conspiracy, where some of you may have encountered his posts. Next, we have Professor Greg Dolan, who's an associate professor of law at the University of Baltimore, uh, and he is also the co director of the Center for Medicine and Law that the University of Baltimore runs with Johns Hopkins University. He is the only one on our panel who has a JD and an MD, so that's pretty cool. Uh, he is uh, interested in patent law and healthcare law. He has authored many law review articles that have been published in the Boston College Law Review, Iowa Law Review, Indiana Law Journal, and Harvard Journal of Law and Technology, among others. And then over here we have Professor Cloris Salong, who's the Max Mendel Shea Professor of Intellectual Property Law at Columbia Law School. Her research interests cover all theoretical and empirical uh, aspects of intellectual property law, and she has published in venues such as the University of Chicago Law Review, Virginia Law Review, and Columbia Law Review. So with that, I hope you're as excited as I am to listen to Professor Soman and everybody else. So let's welcome everyone. for organizing this conference and having us there, and all of you for taking time out to listen. Uh, like your dean, I'm actually not an expert on intellectual property law. This is, in fact, the first time I've ever been on a panel that's specifically focused on IP. So in dealing with IP issues, I feel a little bit like a landlubber going out to sea for the first time. Like, what's that? And all these sailors running around know exactly what the, is done in the rigging and uh, what the function of everything is, and I really don't. Uh, However, uh, in the spirit of fools rushing in where angels fear to tread, and wise men as well, uh, I'm going to go in anyway. Although I have not done much work in intellectual property, I have done a lot of work in eminent domain, including my forthcoming book, and I try to draw on that expertise and leave the IP heavy lifting to the real experts who are going to follow me. Uh, so I'll start off by talking about uh, the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment and whether it actually protects intellectual property at all. This turns out to be a tougher question uh, than is usually imagined, at least from an originalist point of view. Second, I'll talk about public use constraints on the use of eminent domain against intellectual property. The Fifth Amendment says that you can only condemn private property for public use. There are contested uh, arguments about what that means, and I'll try to talk briefly about what it means with respect to intellectual property. 
finally, there are significant locational and jurisdictional issues that may constrain the use of eminent domain to take intellectual property, at least when that's done by state and local governments. And at the very end, if there is time, I'll briefly discuss the compensation uh, that must be paid for the taking of IP uh, when it happens and uh, what sorts of issues might arise from that that might be particular to intellectual property. Uh, so first things first, does the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment actually protect intellectual property at all? Under current Supreme Court precedent, the answer is surely yes. Uh, and if you look at the text of the Fifth Amendment, it seems like it must be yes on that basis as well. After all, it says that private property cannot be taken for just, without paying them just compensation and also unless it's for a public use. And it seems like intellectual property is clearly private property, just like a house or personal property like this piece of paper uh, and so forth. However, although that is the dominant modern view of the subject, from an originalist point of view, there's at least reason for uh, some doubt. Uh, if you look back in the 18th and 19th century, both at the time of the founding when the Fifth Amendment was first adopted, and in 1868 when it first became applicable to state governments as a result of the 14th Amendment, during both of those periods, many people argued that takings provisions in state constitutions and also the Fifth Amendment only protect property that is a natural right and don't protect property rights that are solely created by legislation. This issue actually came up in, in 19th century debates over the emancipation of slaves. When Congress considered abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia, first in the 1830s and again in the 1860s, the defenders of slavery said, if you do this, this is going to be a taking. Uh, and uh, therefore, you have to pay as compensation. After all, slaves are property. They also argued that the taking would not be for a public use, as the Fifth Amendment requires. Why? Because they said that a public use means ownership of the condemned property by the government or access by the general public. And of course, when slaves are freed, they don't become owned by the government or by the general public. They become their own masters, so to speak. So they said this is a taking, and not only that is a taking that's not for a public use. Interestingly, in those debates, which I discuss in greater detail in my forthcoming book about Kilo, uh, the uh, advocates of emancipation, they mainly argued that this was not a taking, and it doesn't matter whether it's for a public use or not. Why? Because slave property, where it exists at all, can only exist based on positive law. It only exists where a state government enacts specific statutes protecting it. Uh, and they said that made it different from what they consider to be genuine, natural property rights, like rights in land or in personal property, which exist uh, in tradition and custom and alike independent of the state and to which we have a natural right. Now, this is certainly not the modern way of looking things. Most lawyers say, well, all property rights are creations of the state. I personally think that's a flawed view. But whether it's flawed or not, it was not the view held at the time of the founding or at the time of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and it potentially calls into question the constitutional protection under a takings clause, not only for slave property, which fortunately we no longer have anymore, but also potentially for intellectual property. Is the traditional view of intellectual property, as also with slave property, uh, is an intellectual property, is the creation of statute. It doesn't exist as a matter of natural right. There was no law of intellectual property until government started enacting statutes saying you have rights of copyright and patent uh, and so forth. So uh, intellectual property seems to be no less purely the creation of legislation uh, than slave property was. It's much better justified. It's not evil in the same way. I'm not saying IP is somehow the moral equivalent of slavery. I'm just making a purely legal point about it. Uh, however, uh, some scholars, like my George Mason colleague Adam Mossoff, have questioned this traditional account of the history of intellectual property. They argue that the founding fathers and others actually did view IP as a function of natural right, at least in part. If that argument is correct, then 
even from an originalist point of view, there would be a strong justification for including intellectual property within the protection of the takings clause. Uh, moreover, obviously, I fully recognize many people are not originalists, so if you're not an originalist, you wouldn't necessarily, this wouldn't necessarily bother you, but if you are one, or if you at least think that the original meaning should have some weight in constitutional interpretation, I think this is an issue that deserves more attention. The last thing I'll add is that obviously, even if there isn't constitutional protection against takings for intellectual property, nothing prevents Congress, or in some cases, state legislatures, from enacting such protection. So it could be that this is not protected by the Constitution, but it's still good policy to do so. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to assume that it is in fact protected by the takings clause and press on to some of the other issues that may arise. And one question that at the beginning is whether takings of intellectual property are for a public use. Broadly speaking, for the last 200 years, there has been debate between two different conceptions of public use. One, which in my work I call the narrow view, says that a public use only arises if the government either uses the condemned property itself or gives it to a private owner who has a legal obligation to serve the entire public. For example, a public utility which must serve all customers who are willing to pay. Then there is the broad view of public use, which says that a public use is anything which might conceivably benefit the public in some way, even if the new owner of the condemned property is a private owner, even if they don't have any special legal obligations to the public, and indeed, even if the government doesn't really prove that the expected public benefit is going to materialize, all they really have to do is assert it, perhaps. This is the doctrine that the Supreme Court has endorsed in cases like Kilo versus City of New London, which I wrote about in my book, and also in Berman versus Parker going back to 1954. Uh, I think the doctrine of the broad view of public use is incorrect. Uh, I think the, support, the Supreme Court got these cases wrong, both from an originalist point of view and also from many living constitution points of view. But I'm not going to get into that debate right now because I think most likely condemnations of intellectual property will probably fit even the narrow view of public use. Usually if the government wants to condemn IP, it's for the purpose of putting the rights into the public domain, which of course would be a situation where the general public has a legal right to use the property, or alternatively perhaps so that the government itself can control the intellectual property, which would also fit the uh, narrow definition of public use. However, there might be some exceptions to this. For example, as I'll discuss in a little bit more detail, some state and local governments have tried to condemn sports teams, or most recently, the television show House of Cards, uh, for the purpose of preventing these entities from moving out of state. Uh, and in cases where state and local governments do that, uh, most likely what they intend is to condemn the franchise, but then to transfer it to a new private owner. That new private owner would not be some sort of public utility, probably it would be an ordinary profit-making business or the like. Uh, and if that is the case, then uh, it would be problematic under the narrow view of public use. Also, since the Kilo decision, some state governments, in fact 45 of them, have enacted post-Kilo reform laws. For the most part, they probably uh, don't affect these takings of intellectual property for narrow public uses, but there are some cases where they could impinge on it uh, in a few of the states which have tougher laws. We can talk about that in questions if people are interested. Uh, I think, however, the tougher issue that arises with the condemnation of intellectual property, particularly by state and local governments, is whether they have jurisdiction over that property in the first place. Uh, traditionally, for very good reason, even people who favor a much broader condemnation power than I would, they still recognize that state and local governments can only condemn property that's within their jurisdiction. For pretty obvious reasons, we wouldn't want New York to be able to condemn property that's located in New Jersey, or vice versa. Uh, and usually for property and land or personal property, it's fairly easy to determine where it's located. The piece of land is either in New York or it's in New Jersey. There are rare cases where there's one lot which somehow is within two states, it's right on the border, but most of the time, it's fairly easy to tell where it is. 
With intellectual property, it actually is not easy at all. Uh, you can say, well, it's wherever the corporation that owns the property is located or the individual where they live, but there are also other possible theories uh, about where it's located. And I think this raises some difficult issues, which courts are only beginning to confront. Uh, I think this question arises in the sports takings. I noted earlier, for instance, uh, when uh, California, when the city of Oakland tried to condemn the Oakland Raiders uh, in the 1980s to keep them from moving to Los Angeles, or when Baltimore tried to condemn the Baltimore Col Colts, uh, who sought to move to Indianapolis. Most recently, the state of Maryland uh, seriously considered condemning the hit TV show House of Cards for the purpose of ke keeping the filming in Maryland. They, they were threatening to uh, move. Uh, with, with both sports franchises and TV shows, they do have some physical property and real property, but mostly their value resides in intangible property like their trademarks and brand names and so forth, and also the contracts that they have with players uh, and with actors in the case of House of Cards. And it's difficult to say exactly where that property is located, and courts in confronting these issues have run into conundrums. This issue also arises in the current litigation over the city of Richmond and California's efforts to condemn mortgages that they claim are underwater. Uh, the mortgages are also an intangible piece of property. It's not actually clear whether they're located within the city of Richmond's jurisdiction. This is one of the questions that the court is going to confront in that case. I do think uh, it is potentially dangerous to allow state and local governments to condemn intellectual property that uh, is only very dubiously within their jurisdiction. Among other things, it might enable them to engage in the use of eminent domain to prevent businesses from moving out of state, thereby undermining intra-jurisdictional mobility and competition. Uh, we want states to be able to attract business or to have incentives to attract businesses by having a good environment for economic development, not by, in effect, forcing businesses to stay in, whether they be the Oakland Raiders or House of Cards uh, or something else. Though it should be said that there is a counter-argument that is that the sports teams here are not completely blameless. Among other things, they tend to lobby for highly inefficient sports subsidies, which pretty much every economist will tell you cause more harm than good subsidies for stadiums. Uh, and sometimes they will threaten to move unless they get more money for their stadium. I think in that instance, the better policy is for the city to say, look, uh, we're not going to pay for your stadium if you decide to move, then you decide to move, but it's not actually in the interest of our people to subsidize this thing, which will probably harm the local economy more than uh, it benefits it, as most studies show. Uh, so uh, I think the solution to this problem is to just say no, rather than to use eminent domain to condemn these four teams. Uh, finally, uh, in the last a minute or so, I'll just briefly raise the issue of compensation. Uh, when property is taken by the government, uh, obviously they're required to pay just compensation. As the Fifth Amendment says, the Supreme Court has consistently said for many decades that just compensation means fair market value, the value that the property will have if sold on the open market. Uh, I think in most cases, dealing with intellectual property, that's probably a good formula. Uh, however, critics of the fair market value approach which include many, many academics, uh, what they say is that it doesn't take into account so-called subjective value. That is, often we own property to which we attach a value that's greater than its market value. A classic example is wedding rings. Uh, if you value your wedding ring only at its market value, if you would sell it at the price that it goes at the open market, you probably don't have a really great marriage. Uh, similarly, many people uh, who have lived in a neighborhood for a long time, uh, they value their house at greater than fair market value because they have social ties and personal connections to a neighborhood. With IP, in most cases, this subjective value problem may not be that significant. With patents and copyrights and the like, usually people own them for purely profit-making reasons. However, some artists, writers, and creators and the like may well attach subjective value to their creations. There are many novels and literature devoted to the feelings that they have about this. And in those cases, subjective value may exist. And you could argue that there should be some extra compensation awarded. Uh, more can be said about this compensation issue, but 
I don't want to take up too much time, and so instead I'll say that I'll be happy to discuss it further in questions, uh, and I very much look forward to the presentation of the other panelists and to the discussion that will follow. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be delving a little bit further into the relationship between IP and property and then Professor Dolan, who is my co-author on a current project on some of these issues, will uh, take us into the land of modern patent law and the developments there and how they relate to eminent domain. So Professor Dolan and I start with the proposition that patents and copyrights are essentially equivalent to the types of property rights that one can obtain in land. This was a major uh, American advance in governance. Back in England, the crown doled out monopolies to its favorites, uh, whereas the founding fathers decided that the grant of exclusive rights should only go to people who actually labor to produce something and then share the fruits of that labor with the public. So in the case of patents, one only gets a patent if and only if one discloses one's invention to the public in sufficient detail that the public can then practice that invention once the patent expires. There are a lot of uh, conflicting opinions on the relationship between IP and property, so I want to uh, say a couple of words specifically about that. So as all of you learned in first year property law, property is not a thing, but rather a relationship between people or between people and things. So in many ways, patents and copyrights are similar to the wild foxes about which you learn in property. A wild fox is not anybody's property until it's been reduced to a captive state. So similarly, an idea to go to the moon is not anybody's property until somebody has actually reduced that idea to a device or a series of steps to uh, accomplish that. Similarly, if we look at copyrights, the idea of a romantic comedy is not owned by anybody until somebody actually writes When Harry Met Sally or uh, another specific work. Now, just like capturing a single wild fox only gives the person rights over that specific fox rather than all foxes out there, uh, so too does designing a rocket or writing When Harry Met Sally grant exclusive rights to that particular invention or that particular literary work, but not to an entire technology or an entire literary genre. The reason that these analogies are important uh, is that optics matter. Professor Dolan and I have uh, debated this point previously, and we don't agree on everything, although we agree on certain important things. Uh, I view uh, not only IP, but also property itself as being part of a larger utilitarian framework. Professor Dolan believes that the reason that we give people property rights in foxes and whales, as well as rocket ship designs and books, is uh, in part because they earned it. He believes that the desserts aspects of property can't be discounted. And in his understanding of property, the desserts argument is one of the reasons for limitations on the government's ability to take property rights outright or to adjust the boundaries uh, of property holders. The logic goes, as part of that argument, that if somebody has earned certain rights, we shouldn't be cavalier about moving the boundaries of that right. We might have good reason to make adjustments to make the entire system and society better off, but the burdens shouldn't disproportionately fall on individual people, especially the ones who have earned those rights. But even if you don't agree with that argument uh, that IP and property should be linked to desert in a natural rights sense, and you see IP more as a government rights privilege, I still think that we can't be uh, cavalier about upsetting, about upsetting settled expectations that have been backed by significant investments of money and time. One way or another, we often treat government privilege, privileges such as licenses to practice as quasi-property interests. So for example, a license to practice medicine uh, is property that can't be divided upon divorce in a number of states. Patents and copyrights are also things that are uh, inheritable and assignable, and they can be divided similarly to other forms of property. Although the Supreme Court and the Federal Circuit have held that patent infringement is a tort and not a taking, that is somewhat problematic from the standpoint of uh, later cases that refer to patents as property and the historical understanding of what a patent is. 
This also doesn't answer the question of whether more, doing more than violating a patentee's rights, such as changing these rights altogether, uh, should be properly analyzed under the takings clause. So in other words, it's one thing for the government to violate a patent, but to continue to allow the patentee to enforce that right against everyone else. It's another to foreclose the patentee's ability to enforce his rights against anybody at all. And this panel might get into uh, the question a little bit later of how that dichotomy can be a little fuzzier in some individual cases, but it is generally, uh, it is generally uh, a truthful um, statement of, of how these cases come about. So with that, I'm going to let Professor Dolan continue this conversation. for having uh, me and all the rest of us here, and uh, Ilya, Professor Selman, for um, giving us an overview of um, intellectual property a bit and eminent domain in greater detail. As Professor Manta mentioned, we are sort of currently working on the article that deals with government's regulation of intellectual property, specifically patent law. And the focus of this paper uh, is the nature of the property right and the current congressional action that affect it. So in the patent world, much actually is somewhat similar to the real property world. The scope of your right is defined by the grant. So for example, if you buy a house and you want to know well, where, where does your lot begin and end, you look at your deed and say, well, you know, 20 feet out east and 50 feet out west and et cetera, and so, and you try to sort of figure out where that is, and that's how you, sort of, you resolve your relationship with your neighbors, right? They know where their lot ends, you know where your lot begins, and that's how you do it based on those boundaries. Well, the patent world is somewhat similar. So in the patent world, the scope of the right is not just based on, well, I better a rocket ship, therefore I own all rocket ships, uh, even if you didn't, even if you were the first one to invent a rocket ship. The scope of your right is defined by the claim that issues. So if you look at the patent document, it consists mostly of two parts or three parts. Part one is kind of a description of your invention in fairly technical terms. Part two sometimes is drawings that you sort of show how your invention will actually look like. And then part three are the claims, basically it begins with what I claim, or if you have multiple uh, inventors, what we claim is. Right? So this, yeah, you're saying, this is what we claim for us, everything else is for the public. So as Judge Giles Rich, who was the author, before he became a judge, author of the current patent law, and then was a judge in the Federal Circuit for many years, and is generally considered to be a father of modern patent law. So he once said, the name of the game, and this is quote, the name of the game is the claim. So everything that is within the claim is covered by your exclusive rights, and everything that is without it is for the public. And copyright and trademark work much the same way, although they don't have perhaps specific claims, right? So if you write a book, the plot, perhaps the characters, the specific wordings are yours, but general ideas as Professor Matt mentioned, romantic comedies are not yours, right? So if just you happen to write a word Harry, Matt, Sally, then somebody can write sort of a different, uh, I guess I'm not up on the modern uh, movies, but then you can think of a more modern romantic comedy, and that would not necessarily infringe on um, that along came Paul, also not very modern, but there it is. <laughs> um, so, what we talk about patents, claims, of course, are written in a highly technical language. Because, you know, if you are invented a new chemical uh, to treat some sort of disease, you want to write it in such a way that a person who understands that particular area of the law or that particular area of science would understand exactly what you mean. So, this highly technical language is directed not at, at the proverbial man on the street but a person of ordinary skill in the relevant field of technology. So pharmaceutical claims for pharma people, engineering claims for engineering people, and so on. And so to understand what's within the scope of the claim and what's outside it, of course, must construe those claims. And again, in reality, it's no different than construing a deed. Again, now some of the deeds are basically easy. They describe it by a lot number or by specific GPS points. But back in the day, Right, we oftentimes said, well, the deed goes to the third tree, you know, out east, and you know, the one that has like four branches, and the other one, and so on. And um, of course, they had to figure out, well, which tree exactly did you mean? And they had to construe those uh, those deeds by, uh, by reference to what exactly the parties meant. And so that's what we do with patents now. Now, for an uninitiated person, I understand, Mr. Man told you that uh, a number of you are one else, so you haven't had a chance to take patent law. But for an uninitiated person, it would seem that the broader your claim, the better it is, right? So you, you, you claim a lot. That means so a lot of it is yours, and so very little is left to the public. And that sort of intuitively makes sense, but actually that's not quite how patent law works. 
Because the way patent law works is the broader your claim, the more likely it is to sweep within its ambit an invention that came long before you came on the scene. For some man to mention, you only get a patent if you actually invent something new. You don't get a patent simply because you managed to copy somebody else or because you, sort of, you explain the idea in a better way. You only get patents on things that are actually new. And so the broader your claim, so the more, if you say, well, I claim all pens, okay, not just some sort of new improvement of pens, I claim all pens, well, guess what? Pens were around long before I was born. And therefore, I shouldn't, if somehow managed to get the claim issued, that claim is obviously invalid because I'm trying to sweep within my own personal property, not just things that I've invented, but things that came long before me. So that's why broad claims are not necessarily best claims. So a patent claim always, a patentee, or a, a putative patentee, the one who applies for a patent, always should seek to strike a balance between being broad enough to, be me to have a meaningful exclusion, right? Because if I just claim, again, going back to pens, if I claim a very specific, highly technical type of pen, it's very easy to avoid infringement. You just change one little feature on it, and all of a sudden, going off, you're not violating my exclusive rights. So my patent, I have it, but not particularly valuable. So I want to be broad enough to capture enough people that I can you know, make money off this patent, but narrow enough to avoid capturing what came before me, so to be considered, near enough to be considered a new invention. So the bottom line is that it matters greatly how a claim is construed. And up until recently, the law has been that before the patent issue, so you, the way you get a patent, you describe your invention, you go to the patent office and say, here's my drawings, here's my description, here's my claim, I want a patent. And a patent, he, uh, and so the patent examiner sits there and he actually he examines your patent. He compares it to what came before. Uh, it's a highly technical examination and usually rejects it. And then you go back and forth saying, no, you didn't understand what I was saying to you. It was actually my, you know, you thought that my claim covers these things, but actually it doesn't. It's actually a bit more narrow. And you go through some amendments and so on. And so up until recently, the law was that before your claim issues, your proposed claim is given as broad as reasonable meaning. And that makes sense. Because what that office wants is to push back on your claim, right? They want to they want to see how far you're actually trying to go, and they want to push back so to establish more firm boundaries. Kind of much like law professors push you uh, against the arguments that you make. You know, you ask your questions, or practically you say, well, something, 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 and say, well, have you thought of this? And this isn't that why your response fails? And then you try to modify your response a little bit. And that's exactly the process in the patent office. The patent office pushes back on you. You sort of modify your claims until you get the language that actually issues. But once it issues, the claim uh, is usually construed, or has always been construed, to mean what a person of ordinary skill in the relevant technology uh, would understand it to mean. And that also makes sense. Because after all, patents are written in technical language meant to be understood by those versed in the relevant technology. So it's no longer trying to push back on you. Now you've actually you've made your claim, you've given, or given your property right. And so the issue claim is no longer given as broad as reasonable construction, but a construction that is reasonable and appropriate to the relevant scientific field. And because of this long-standing rule, patentees draft their language and argue infringement cases accordingly. They have defined and negotiated the scope of their right with the government, and they can rest secure with respect to that scope. Or at least they could have rested secure until a few years ago. A few years ago, Congress passed the act that was sort of hailed as the greatest revision of patent law since 1952 was known as the Lady Smith America Invents Act. That sounds great, right? America Invents is just such a good thing, right? Um, but it turns out it has a number of unintended problems. So what America Invents Act, a shorthand known as AIA, created is a number of avenues for the patent office to take a second look at your already issued patents. This process created a number of problems, which I've discussed in my last article that's about to come out at Boston uh, Law Review, Boston College Law Review, in a couple of weeks, uh, called Dubious Patent Reform. So if you're interested in one slot to 80 pages of patent talk, uh, there it is. But the most significant change, however, was that under these new procedures, the test to test patent validity or invalidity in the PTO, again, before you used to test it based on what the claim meant to a person of reason of ordinary skill in the art. But under these new procedures, you go back to this much broader claim. As if this claim had not been ever issued. So in this sense, the government simply changes the scope of the patents right by fiat, right? They used to mean one thing, and the government, after passing the American Advance Act, simply changes your boundaries. 
So remember, for the patentee, it's important to have a claim that's neither too broad nor too narrow. It is this balance that defines his right. So imagine, for example, the government promulgated a blanket decree that simply narrowed the scope of all issued patent claims. That would immediately diminish the value of issued patents, perhaps down to zero, because they would simply not cover as much ground as they did when they were issued. So in other words, the government would simply have taken for public use, as uh, Professor Solomon admitted, most of the time the government takes a patent, is generally taken for public use, um, because you know now you can, the public can practice it. At least they would have taken that area between what the claim meant originally and what it was ordered to mean post statutory language. But going in the other direction is equally problematic. Just like it's problematic to just narrow the claim by fiat, it's problematic to broaden the claim by fiat because it has the same ultimate effect. If by narrowing, you're sort of allowing people to practice the area between the original meaning and the narrowed meaning. Now you're doing actually something worse by broadening the claim and sweeping within it all the art that came before, so making it much easier to invalidate. You're actually not just granting the public that area in between, but potentially granting the public the whole patent wants to get some value. Making matters worse still uh, is the problem that up until American Invents Act passed, in order to invalidate an issued patent, you have to prove your case by clear and convincing evidence. A little bit lower than uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, but more than just mere preponderance. After American Invents Act, if you choose to go the, you have the patent reviewed at the Patent and Trademark Office as opposed to the court, you, can, you need to merely prove your case by preponderance of the evidence. So broader claim, making it easier to invalidate, Lower standard of proof, making it again easier to prove a case by a challenger, uh, makes it much, uh, makes it significantly diminishes uh, the patent scope and therefore the, the value of the patent right. Now, I think Professor Matt and I, uh, we're in full, full agreement with Professor Soman that when government adjusts the scope of the patent, when government adjusts your patent rights or takes them completely away, usually it's done for the public use. Uh, the classic case, for example, there's an, a, na a natural disaster, an epidemic, and you just need to produce drugs very quickly. And you say, look, we just don't care about patent rights. We actually threatened to do something very similar. Those of you who remember in 2001, after September 11th, there was also an after, following very quickly after that, there was an anthrax scare. And we thought that that's just not going to be an incident, one-off incident that we may need to treat millions of people. At that time, the only drug to treat anthrax was on patent. And we told, I think it was Bayer who owned the patent. We told them, Either start producing them cheaply, or we're just going to start producing them ourselves without ignoring your patent because the other, you know, the other options that people will die. Right? Luckily, none of that happened. But so that would be sort of classic public use. But even in this case of adjustment boundaries, that also be public use because, as uh, Congress uh, said when it is enacted, American Invents Act, um, a lot of it is done so to improve confidence in the patent system, to improve. Um, both for investors and the patentees, and so to improve the patent system overall. And that is sort of, that is a, a good public purpose to adjust the patent system. The problem, although again, in my article that I mentioned that's coming out in Boston College, I question whether that has been accomplished, whether it's, um, con Congress is uh, succeeded in its, its purpose. But the point is, they are doing public purpose. But the thing of it is, the way Congress is doing it is pl pl placing more burdens on the patentees than on the rest of the public. They're carrying this proportionate burden. So the small group of people are paying for the benefits supposedly that the rest of us are acquiring. So with that, I think my time is expiring. So I mentioned simply one thing, that although our uh, Professor Mantis and my paper is focusing on patents, um, we worry that this disregard for, uh, for rights of IP holders may spread into other areas as well, for trademark, for copyright, in part because Nobody has ever taken the takings clause as, as it's applied to IP very seriously. And we hope that both our papers and this discussion will actually change that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Long. I'll just stay here in my seat uh, to give my presentation. I'll make three points. First of all, uh, the Supreme Court has never really told us what a patent taking or an intellectual property taking would look like. But a lower court, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, has opined a little bit on that. So we'll lay out the case uh, discussing that. And then second of all, speculate from there on these rather oracular uh, pronouncements that the Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit has said what wouldn't constitute a taking going forward, and then point to some cases that I, or instances that I pretty clearly think would constitute a taking, or at least the federal government acts as if they're engaging in a taking, even if they don't use the word taking. So first of all, uh, what 
is uh, what have the courts said about what might possibly constitute a taking. There's exactly one case on this, it's called Zoltec. It's a case that has fascinated me because it's been going on now for more than 20 years. It is the zombie of, uh, of patent cases and every time that the parties think that everything is resolved, the case comes to life again and I am so not ready for the zombie apocalypse. I am fascinated by the Zoltec case because here is the factual background behind it. A company, Zoltec, created and got a patent on carbon fibers that effectively had only one use, and that was in military defense technology. These are the carbon fibers that are used in the stealth fighter. They're what makes the stealth fighter invisible to, uh, to, uh, to whatever detection technology is usually used to, uh, to detect these things. There's exactly one legal buyer for this technology, and that legal buyer is the U.S. government. So when Lockheed Martin got a contract to create the stealth fighter for the U.S. government, the Department of Defense commanded Lockheed Martin to build the stealth fighter using this carbon fiber technology. And if you're a government contractor, especially in a DOD circumstance, if the government commands you to do something, you do it first and then fight about it later. And so Lockheed went out and used this carbon fiber technology without paying Zoltec in the stealth fighter. Now it's not clear if Lockheed knew that there was a patent. There's, there's a lot in this case that, that, that's under seal because it involves military defense technology. But everybody agrees Lockheed Martin used the carbon fiber technology at the command of the US government in the stealth fighter without Zoltec's permission. Zoltec sued for a taking, and they lost. They lost, says the Federal Circuit, because this is an infringement, the Federal Circuit ruled. It sounds in tort. It's not a taking sounding in property in the Fifth Amendment uh, waiver of sovereign immunity. Instead, said the Federal Circuit, it's an infringement involving uh, uh, tort and a waiver of sovereign immunity under the Tucker Act. Now why is this important? If it's an infringement, suddenly the case becomes a lot more complicated because now the question is going in and looking at the boundaries of the patent to see if Lockheed's use actually infringed the patent. And since Lockheed has protection, Lockheed has the protection of the U.S. government, the U.S. government of course would be the deep pocket in either case. So. Uh, why is this not a taking? The Federal Circuit ruled that it's not a taking because the patent right uh, includes the ability to exclude others from making, using, or selling one's invention. And Lockheed was just one user. Zoltec, the patentee, could still exclude the rest of the world from using their invention. They were just uh, not being able to exclude one user, and that one user was Lockheed acting at the command of the U.S. government. And this, said the Federal Circuit, makes it an infringement, a use of property without permission, not a taking of property, not a complete inability of the patent holder to be able to exclude others. Now, it made no difference that the patentee pointed out that this is a situation of a monopsony buyer. There's only one legal buyer for this product, and that is the U.S. government. That did not matter. And so the case continues with all sorts of twists and turns as to whether or not this actually constitutes an infringement such that the U.S. government has to pay damages to Zoltec, and if so, how much, and so on and so forth, going on for uh, 20 years. So, looking forward, well, here, here's my, let me just drop a footnote and point out, I think that the Federal Circuit decided that case the way it did for prudential reasons. The Federal Circuit did not want to write an open check because who knows how much the Department of Defense would have to pay out if it was determined that this patent had been taken. So what wouldn't, or what, what else wouldn't be a taking? Some other things that wouldn't be a taking on that kind of logic, uh, 
occur if, say, for example, suppose that a patent is issued, somebody challenges the patent and takes the patent back to the Patent and Trademark Office and says, Patent and Trademark Office, I think you made a mistake when this patent was issued. The invention is not new, it's not useful, it's not, uh, it's not non-obvious, there's some other flaw. Suppose the Patent Office says, yes, you're right, we made a mistake, we're invalidating the patent. That's not a taking. That's a correction of a right you never should have, the patent you never should have gotten to begin with. So those kinds of things wouldn't constitute takings. What else wouldn't constitute a taking, or at least in my case, uh, in, in my personal view, are, it's, it's hard to say that uh, it would constitute a taking. And this is the example that uh, Professor Dolan gave of post 9-11, the buyer patent on the uh, vaccine for anthrax. Suppose the Congress said, we are going to throw open a patent so that other entities in the industry can use it as well, but the patentee can still practice their invention. And they can still, and they can still exclude all of the rest of the world except maybe these half a dozen drug companies that are producing the product. Would that constitute a taking? I think it's a closer case than Zoltec, but I would expect government lawyers to argue that this is very much like Zoltec in that the Bayer company could still exclude the rest of the world, just not the other half dozen drug companies or so that would be allowed to practice the invention, and they weren't losing the patent rights themselves, so if anything, it would be an infringement, but not a taking. So then, what might constitute a taking? It's a procedure that is, uh, there's a procedure in the patent office that is shrouded in secrecy. There's a provision in the patent code that says, if the patent office notices that a particular technology, in its own judgment, could be a threat to national security, and the technology is otherwise valid, it's new, useful, not obvious, meets all of the requirements to be able to get a patent, what the government will do is they'll do a forced transfer of patent rights from the patentee to the government. They don't call this a taking, but why does that look like a taking to me? The patent is then never published, because after all, if it's a threat to national security, the, this, shouldn't be, this information shouldn't be published in documents that everybody can read, and the government then compensates the patentee for the forced transfer of their patent rights. That looks very much like a taking to me. The problem then arises because the government argues that the compensation is due not when the transfer of rights occurs at time zero, but since a patent has a term of 20 years from the date of filing, the compensation should occur 20 years down the road once the patent expires. Now, of course, the U.S. government would take this position because a dollar today is worth a lot more than a dollar 20 years down the road. 20 years down the road, the inventor may be dead, the estate may not know that this patent is out there awaiting compensation. The government's argument is that it takes 20 years to figure out how much these potentially dangerous technologies are actually worth. And so the patentees in those cases almost invariably lose on the timing issue, and as for the compensation issue, those cases are, are shrouded in secrecy. I have foia the PTO to try to get a sense of how often this happens, and it happens about 300 times a year that uh, uh, patentees have their rights forcibly uh, transferred. I wasn't able to get any kind of information about compensation or how these uh, particular technologies are identified, although I will say that I have proposed, and if any of you want to, uh, to, to give me money for my startup, you can do so. I have proposed a business model, I want a patent business model, in which my business model is to theorize technologies that could be deemed to be uh, detrimental to national security of the United States so that they will be taken and so that I can be compensated perhaps 20 years down the road. And I want to patent that because if the government can game the system about compensation and when compensation should occur and what a taking is, well, by golly, patentees ought to be able to game the system as well. So, uh, so if you want to donate money to my project, you're welcome to do so. Uh, so I think we're going to take
but first on the panel, if you want to ask a question, you can do so, and if it's just a general question, that's what you can do. Uh, Ron. Yes, my question is for Professor Soli. Um, it's about the uh, it's about the question of whether IP is a statutory versus a natural right. From an originalist perspective, it does seem that there is a strong case to be made that it is statutory because doesn't Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution grant Congress the power to issue patents and copyrights? So that that makes it seem like the uh, that makes it seem like the right is legislative and not natural. I'm just wondering how a natural right, natural rights proponent would respond to that. So I don't necessarily disagree with you myself. Uh, I think that uh, the defenders of natural rights theory, and to really look at this, you want to read the articles by my colleague, Professor Mossoff and other scholars who take this position, but they would say that uh, what this does is it just recognizes rights that people already had a pre-existing claim to, but Congress's power is simply the power to delineate their boundaries and enforce them, much as, for instance, uh, with respect to real property, state governments may have the power to define and punish trespasses and the like, but that doesn't mean that the real property exists solely because the state government has uh, created the right. Now, I think this response is far from completely airtight, um, and there are various relevant differences in raised. I personally don't have a very strong viewpoint on whether as an originalist matter uh, IP rights were considered more as natural rights or as purely statutory creations. I think there's a serious case to be made either way, but the fact that for centuries under the common law uh, in uh, English and Anglo-American legal tradition, there wasn't really a tradition of enforceable uh, IP rights in the same way as there was for rights in real and personal property. I think that cuts against, to some degree, at least the natural rights theory, but uh, the defenders of it do have arguments of their own. I have a question for Professor, the final presenter, and uh, I just wanted to know more about the website that you have. Mm -hmm. oh, I, oh, I was just kidding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 it would, but it would be a great idea. Absolutely. To, like, I mean, I'm quite serious, it would be a great idea to come up with a business model which involved theorizing inventions that were deemed to be the national detriment of the national security of the United States, such that they would have to bring them up. It's like medicine. Isn't there a rule against patents and business models? No, there isn't. No, there, is, there is. There are, there are constraints within, within which you have to do it, but you can uh, patent a business model. Now, having said that, I have exactly one year to get to the patent office and file my, my patent application <laughs> on that particular business model. But, uh, I'll, I did have my tongue in cheek about my about the website, but you know if you if you do want to fund my research, I'm happy to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is for Professor Wong. So, in the Zoltan case, it seemed that they retained ownership of the patent. Correct. But through their defense, it suggests that there are instances where there is a taking, but they retain ownership. So that's my question: Can that ever happen? Right. Well. <clears throat> We don't know, uh, because in, in Zoltec, you're absolutely right, Zoltec, the patentee retained ownership and that was declared to be an infringement and not a taking. So then the question is, well, what does it mean for there to be a taking? And that's why I say it's not clear to me that if Congress comes along and tells the Bayer Corporation, we're letting everybody else use your patent, that that would be a taking, because as long as Bayer can still use the patent himself, then you following the Zoltec logic, we say, oh, that's infringement. That's not a taking. So what clearly is a taking? It's clearly a taking if the patentee has all of their rights taken away from them and the federal government says, or I should say does not say, that they made a mistake in granting the rights to be given. So I think you absolutely need those two things in order for there to be a patent taking. How far beyond that we can go is it is completely undecided, and I am not very sanguine that we can push too far beyond that, although I'd love to hear the views of others in the panel. One very small point. I would note that outside the IP area, there are plenty of cases where there are takings, and the courts agree that there are, even in cases where the government hasn't completely taken away your right to a piece of land. For instance, in two well-known Supreme Court decisions in the 1990s, Nolan and Dolan, the court ruled that 
it is a take if the government says the general public can walk through your land or have access to it, even though you still retain other ownership rights as the right to build structures on the property or to exclude people from living there and so forth. Uh, and there are also cases where the government says you retain ownership, but you're not allowed to build anything of any kind in a property, so 100% of its economic value is wiped out for you, even though you still have the title deed to the land that's considered a taking. There are some other examples as well. Whether or not those sorts of analogies to real property work in IP, that I gather is something that is being debated and be uh, litigated in the lower courts right now. And I'll, I would also add that, um, I mean, part of obviously this, the, part of the problem with this debate is that by its very nature, IP is incorporeal. So when we talk about, I assume, what you mean, Autumn Loretto? Right, the, the cable box case? Right, okay, so I assume you've read them for tomorrow. Um, <laughs> But, you know, so it's easy, right? There's an actual physical box that you can go and touch, and then on the top of an actual physical book here, you can go and touch, right? You can see, well, once we put the box here, not, you know, just lo simple laws of physics, right? Once the box is here, nothing else can be there, even though you've retained the ownership of the book. I mean, IP doesn't really work this way because by its very nature, it's more real. But it seems to me, um, and I'm certainly taking a lot of flack for this view, I'm happy to take some more from this panel, that once Government, again, it's one thing when it says, perhaps it's different when it just infringes and uh, for national security reasons or whatever other uh, reasons, there's just infringement and you can still practice it yourself and so on. But it seems to me when the government literally moves the boundaries of your patent and says, well, you used to own this much, right? and now we just, we're going to pass a law saying that everybody that claimed this much now will only get this much, even though you wrote your patent to be that much. It seems to me that is much more akin to a physical taking a la Loretto where you know, that place where you used to be able to put you know, your water heater or whatever else, now has to be occupied by the cable box. It's not a perfect analogy, again, because IP patents are incorporeal entities, that right? you can't actually go and physically touch them. But it seems to me, to, me, to be a, the, the closest, the, the most correct way to analyze it. But I know that he was not doing something. I'm actually wondering on that point what Professor Solomon and Blum think about whether the IP uh, taking fit more into the examples of physical takings or more into the examples of regulatory takings. And that, I'm wondering whether part of the problem, part of the problem with this discussion is OPEC, is arising out of that. So, Also, I can't believe they haven't made cars out of that thing, so I can be in from the you know, police radio. <laughs> so, so Zoltec, to me, strikes me as the classic perfect analogy to a regulatory taking. Your property isn't being, you're not being physically deprived of your property, it's not eminent domain, but restrictions are being put on how you can use it, and the economic value of it is being diminished. In the case of Zoltec, the economic value of the patent is diminished pretty much 100%. If you have a monopsony buyer, the US government, the only person, the only entity you can legally sell to, and they won't pay you for it. That strikes me as a perfect regulatory takings uh, scenario. And in the Federal Circuit three-judge panel, the property expert on the panel, Judge uh, Plager, who was a property professor before becoming a judge, said, yes, this is a taking. And the other two members disagreed. Again, the only explanation I really have for it is that the Federal Circuit didn't want to write an open-ended check. Because as soon as they say, yes, this is a taking, then the question is, how much money does the US government now owe? And I don't think the Federal Circuit wanted to go there. But I think the regulatory takings analogy is, is a lot, uh, it is relevant and is a lot uh, better than eminent domain style taking, a physical taking, and yet the Federal Circuit has taken us down this physical road that you have to lose all of your rights effectively before it's deemed to be taken. So a couple of thoughts on this. I, I agree with the other panelists that it's more closely analogous to regulatory taking jurisprudence than the physical taking. Indeed, it seems like virtually any taking of IP would be a regulatory taking because with IP, almost by its very nature, there's no physical object to take, like a pen or a piece of land. Uh, it's all uh, regulatory because it's all incorporeal, in as, uh, as Greg said. 
Uh, however, uh, a couple points in this. Even under the regulatory takings doctrine, although that doctrine usually is more deferential to the government than physical takings, still, if the, regu if the regulation in question destroys 100% of the value of your property, it's still a taking and you still have to get compensation. It seems like, if I understand you correctly, that's what happened in that Soltec case. They had no economic value of any uh, meaningful kind was left whatsoever. So that's pretty similar to saying uh, you technically still own your piece of land, but you can't build anything on it of any kind, not even like a dog house or a tree house or whatever. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, it would still be a regulatory taking. The last thing I would say is that, uh, like a number of other scholars, though I don't know whether that includes people on this panel or not, I actually question the sharp distinction the Supreme Court has drawn between regulatory and physical invasion takings, because as you learned in uh, intro to property laws, uh, Professor Manna mentioned earlier, uh, all property rights understood from an economic point of view are really rights not to a particular object, but rather to a particular use or control of that object. So uh, it seems to me that it's just as much of an infringement on your right to say you can no longer use the property the way that you had before as to say that the technical title deed will be transferred to somebody else. Uh, one of those might uh, harm you more in one case than the other, will depend on the circumstances, but both, I think, are a deprivation of property rights and therefore should be considered uh, as a taking in the same way as opposed to saying, well, it's very different if you're deprived of your right by people walking over your land as opposed to government simply saying you're not allowed to uh, use the land. One of the, the second, in some cases, can be as much or uh, more burdensome than the first, but even if you accept the regulatory versus physical distinction which from the Supreme Court does, it seems to me that at least the case you described with Zoltec, that fits that uh, sort of extreme case uh, where the Supreme Court has said that uh, if you lose 100% of the value of your property from a government regulation, then it's still a taking and you get compensated. It seems like that's, that fits exactly that situation. And by the way, the court does not limit that doctrine to cases where the government wouldn't have to pay too much money. It depends on the fair market value of what you lost. Not sure what the fair market value of this sort of weapon would be. Uh, that's you know, a difficult calculation, but it seems like it should be a taking. Well, I think we're um, I think we're out of time, so I think we're going to stop here. And I want to thank all my uh, co